Hey everybody, Tanya Hutchins. We're coming up on Activate Live in about three minutes, and we are going to talk to Mike Evans, who's an organizer, and we'll also talk with Charlie McAuliffe, who is our unofficial historian. So stand by, three o'clock for Activate Live, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, um, and you'll hear from Mike Evans and Charlie McAuliffe. So stay with us. Welcome to our replay viewers. This is our pre-show. It's the show before the show, and it's just a few minutes. It's 2.58, right before um, Activate Live is starting officially. So I'm wearing a shirt from Local 701, um, so we're showing some solidarity with that Mechanics Local. Um, and our guests today are going to be Mike Evans, who's the lead organizer at Boeing South Carolina, and we'll also speak with Charlie McAuliffe and Charlie is our unofficial historian, so we'll be talking with him um, as well. So we only have a couple minutes to go, about one minute. In the meantime, I'm going to bring in Mike Evans really briefly to tell us a little bit about where he first started out and how he got involved with the union. So I'll leave it up to you, Mike, while I start the stream. Okay. Um, well, I come out of a shop up here in Woods, Rocks, Connecticut, called Hamilton Sunstrand, a division of United Technologies. I joined the machinist union in 1991. Um, it really was based on the fact that I needed to call a steward out for the first time, and I was in an open shop. I didn't know anything about the union, so I saw a well-rounded, educated steward assist me through some uh, issues I was having. I learned the value of having representation at that time, and ever since then, I've been a strong supporter. I've gotten really active in my local lodge. I've volunteered from everything from assisting with political, um, action to uh, assisting with organizing drives and stuff, and I just really enjoyed it and I understood the power of what it means to organize. I had a collective voice and I've been going ever since. That is wonderful. Thanks so much and we're so excited that you're taking the time to talk to us today. So I think right now we just have a little bit more time. Yep, it's three o'clock. So let's get started if Joe's ready. Activated now. Voice activation. Live from Maryland. Maryland. This, this is Activate Live. Live. Welcome to Activate Live. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Activate Live is a show that allows union members and workers to activate their voices to make a difference in their communities. I'm Tanya Hutchins in the Machinist Union headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Nearly a week ago, about 180 flight readiness technicians at Boeing, South Carolina, voted on whether to join the Machinist Union, and the majority of them voted yes by a count of 104 to 65. Joining us now to talk about how the vote came about and what it means to the flight line mechanics is lead organizer Mike Evans. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Well, thanks for having me, Tanya. Mike, first off, who approached whom first? Well, the flight readiness technicians approached us and uh, we had a discussion about the fact that, you know, obviously we went after the larger unit back in 2017. So we had to do a, an in-depth look at what was possible about uh, determining an appropriate unit for them. And uh, from there, we had that discussion and we went forward. Uh, but yeah, they did approach us, and they were really excited that we were able to support them. What were they trying to change? Um, at this particular site, I, you know, a number of issues, but one that really bubbled to the top was the inconsistent work rules. Um, you know, Boeing has its normal policies like any other large employer. But, but, however, we, uh, a worker couldn't rely on those policies. There was always this thing that kind of the culture kind of fed into was called management discretion. So the workers never came to work really understanding what was expected on a day-to-day -day basis, what today's policy can be related to work performance or attendance. So they're really looking for some consistency. Mike, this is a win in the South where traditionally it's often challenging for unions to organize. What does this particular win say to workers across the South? It's possible. They don't have to, they don't have to accept less uh, because they're in the South. This is a federal protected right for an organization like the IAM, um, and it'll give them a voice at the table that many in 
South Carolina and in the South don't have right now and maybe are a little confused what is an option for them. Um, we're in the South. We continue to keep organizing the South. And I, I think this is a place where people are going to start realizing it's time that they stand up and protect those kind of jobs that provide middle class wages. Now, you've often said that the workers did the work on this campaign. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, the workers, um, after going through the last campaign, um, they knew what they were up against. They knew they were going to get something tough. Um, so they joined together. They just had a large discussion among themselves of what was going to be acceptable, unacceptable during the campaign. They decided to take the high road and made a professional trail. We did a lot of education around that. We made sure everybody understood their rights uh, in the process of concerted activity, protecting them during um, organizing, and what to expect after they're done and successful. But you have a voice at the table, you sit down and have that uh, opportunity to bargain. Now you had a meeting, and John Holden was there from IAM District 751 in Seattle, Washington, and some of the workers. What was that like? That was great. That gave us an opportunity to really take on one of the sticking points that Boeing put a lot of um, emphasis on. They really tried to divide the workers in both ways. Um, so to be able to bring John in and put a, a name to a face and see that John, his concerns are the same as all working people, so that we have to you know, work together across the country uh, to um, benefit all workers. And this is just as important as it is anywhere else to happen in the South. Um, they were able to ask John a lot of questions. Um, we were able to put a lot of rumors and misinformation about um, their perception of the workers in South Carolina and vice versa to rest. Um, and I, I witnessed the uh, beginning of what I believe is going to be a great working relationship between these two locals. And we have a picture here with John Holden on the left, and we have the director of organizing, um, Vinny Adio, all the way to the right here with some of the workers that were instrumental um, in this campaign that they brought to the union, as you said. What was the actual voting process like on May 31st? Um, that particular day, it was really high energy. Uh, we were excited. We felt we were in a really good place in this campaign. Uh, we did we did understand that the company felt they were in a good place too. Uh, the energy was high. Uh, it was, you know, they brought us onto the property. We obviously went through the opening of polls and so forth to make sure everything was secure and safe for a fair and uh, their election free of intimidation and harassment. But the energy was high. We felt we were in a good place and the outcome uh, showed that we were we prepared everything we needed to prepare and the outcome was predictable. Now for people who were wondering, the NLRB or the National Labor Relations Board was there, correct? Yeah, it, it, at this process they own. The government owns the process of the, uh, the voting. Um, so they come in, they handle all the ballot, secret ballot election process. They actually, it's very similar to going Maybe to your town gym at the local school and casting a ballot for a, a local representative. It's a secret ballot process. You're giving a ballot, you go to a stand, you your ballot, and put it in. Um, only they handle the ballot. The town is done by the NLRB, um, and the voting tally is handled and signed off by both parties. So, what happens next? Well, right now, um, this week, at the end of this week, we're anticipating the certification of the election. Um, we feel the company doesn't have any reason to file any objections to the process of the voting. Um, so we're anticipating that this week. And after that, we're going to um, reach out to Boeing and, and do an information request and also start considering what days are feasible for us to sit and begin the negotiation process. Have you begun the messages of support from other workers in the community? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've been receiving uh, through this whole process. The community really stepped up. I mean, we did have a Facebook page that was going. You can see there's people reaching out to the Facebook page. Uh, I was receiving emails. There was even people that sometimes in the street at the gas station uh, expressed their support from these guys uh, going union. Um, the workers themselves that weren't organizing at this time, because remember, there's there's about 2,500 hourly employees there, and this is just one unit, the flight line. It was also demonstrating a lot of support for these guys. They were also reaching out. From what I understand, within about 24 hours to 48 hours, um, people were taking the opportunity to come out to the flight line and wish these guys well. Um, so it was kind of um, kind of exciting. It was kind of nice to see. We had a lot of support. Anything else you'd like to mention, Mike? Um, when it comes to the South, 
you know, the I am's here, right? I mean, every worker deserves an opportunity to voice at the table. Every worker deserves a fair amount of rights and protections on the job. But remember, people are dedicated to working their lives to helping a company stay successful. And they need to share that success in a fair and equitable way. And when you go to union, that's your opportunity to have that discussion. So we're in the South. We're going to continue to stay in the South. I look forward to working with um, other workers um, right down there in the North Charleston area if possible. And uh, we'll continue to fight. Thanks so much, Mike Evans, lead organizer of the Boeing South Carolina campaign. Please join the conversation by commenting on this video and letting us know what you think about joining together in union to improve working conditions, wages, and to have a better life. You can do that on Facebook or on Twitter, hit the reply button, or you can use live chat on YouTube. Well, I want to give a shout out to members of IAM Local 701 in Chicagoland. I am wearing their shirt today, that's their logo right here, in solidarity with the members on the strike line that's back up at Napleton Cadillac in Libertyville. Now, the workers are fighting for their first contract after a favorable decision from the National Labor Relations Board. The local filed multiple unfair labor charges against the dealership last year after management tried to intimidate workers with threatening letters, rolling out mechanics' toolboxes, including one that was left in the rain, damaging its electronics. I think that one was worth $100,000. A rally is scheduled there for June 25th, so mark your calendar to show your support for our members in the Midwest Territory. Well, looking back on this day in 1933, the U.S. Employment Service was created and we're just going to take a look back at this week in history. In 1937, 12,000 auto workers and others went on strike in Lansing, Michigan, shutting down the city for a month. It was later known as the labor holiday. Nine, nine workers were arrested, including the wife of the local union president, living their three children home alone. June 6 is also D-Day, the day in 1944 that Allied forces landed on the beaches of Normandy, France, during World War II. The Battle of Normandy lasted two months and resulted in a decisive Allied victory. And former U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated on this day in 1968, nearly five years after his brother, John F. Kennedy. So this is a busy week when it comes to history, employment, and standing up for what's right. About a month ago, we celebrated the founding of our union, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, also known as the IAM, or simply the Machinist Union. Our unofficial historian, Charlie McAuliffe, joins us now with some interesting stories and tidbits about our union's humble beginnings and other historical facts. Charlie retired from the IAM as Director of Retirees and EAP Services. So, Charlie, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, our union was founded on May 5th, 1888, 130 years ago. What kind of environment was the Machinist Union born into? Wow. Uh, it was a rough time for uh, workers in general. And uh, the machinists uh, working throughout the country were having a hard time. Now, some of them had been joining different machinist unions for our machinist union. And there's a history to all that that I can go over if you want. Sure. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, Tom Talbot and the 19 machinists in Atlanta, Georgia, are credited with creating our machine, the International Association of Machinists. But there had been machinist union before this, uh, a lot of false attempts. Most, the largest and most significant was the blacksmith and machine union. And not directly related to us, but it was an indication of machinists uh, joining. There also had been machinists and mechanics union, as it was called, uh, as a part of the Knights of Honor and the Knights of Pythias, and of course the Knights of Labor. And Tom, Tom Talbot, who was a member we started our union was a member of all of those organizations uh, before our union was created. So there was a lot of attempts to create our union, and most importantly, machinists trying to create a union. That was a, uh, a very important time period. 
And one of the people that he met with uh, was Terrence Powderly, is that correct? Yes, Terrence Powderly was the president of the uh, Knights of Labor. Now, the Knights of Labor started in 1869 and uh, uh, really fell apart in uh, 1886 after the hay market arrived. This was a time of this period in uh, 1886 and before in 1877 when there had been large demonstrations of riots against employers. Uh, most of the employers at that time, the big employers, were uh, pretty tough and ruthless, uh, employed a lot of uh, uh, what they referred to as that time goons and uh, to beat up union people trying to create unions and assassinating a lot of union activists. Terence Powderly in the Knights of Labor, now I want to say this carefully, was part of the Christian socialist movement of the latter part of uh, the 1800s. The Christian socialist movement has a real deep history in America. And very, as the name implies, kind of implies really a part of Christianity at that time. Um, and, and Christianity was really opposed to some of the evils that employers, uh, you know, in the work arena, large employers were uh, the environment they created. So it was a very important time. Uh, Tom Talbot was, uh, as I said earlier, a member of the Knights of Labor and a member of the different organizations. He, he, uh, he was uh, very active in the labor movement. Excuse me, somebody walked in. Um, uh, very active in the labor movement, uh, trying to create organizations, but he really had a couple of false starts, and uh, this was uh, a part of his heritage in the labor movement. He learned a lot from joining those other organizations. Uh, the Knights of Honor uh, were really an outgrowth of the Mechanics Union and uh, um, several other unions uh, combined. They, they, they wouldn't last long. Um, it, was, uh, it was a learning experience, but that socialist movement, Christian socialists, I, when I use the word socialist, most people start you know, uh, thinking strange things because most people don't understand what that means. But the Christian socialist movement was very important. Uh, honor one another, um, absolute truth, uh, being, you know, being forgiving of people, visiting people in jail, the whole whole idea of Christianity uh, was a very important thing. And he was a part of that. And that was a part of our early start. Now, a lot of people will say that, yes, many of the machinists were masons, uh, but the real, the real heritage of the machinist comes out of the Knights of Labor. Uh, both are the way we call our assemblies, uh, districts, lo district lodges, uh, uh, local lodges, grand lodge, all comes from the Knights of Labor. Does it have to do with conventions as well? Because I know that first convention, we have a famous photo of that. Yeah, uh, our first convention in uh, 18... Uh, <coughs> it was very important because uh, the union, although the union was struggling, um, and, and, but it was growing very fast. And we attribute that, that's attributed to uh, uh, boomers in our industry, the railroad industry. The term boomer, boomer really means somebody moving to an area called a boom town, where there was a lot of work, good wages work the hours you want and it was so it was a boom condition so boomers followed where the work was and that was true of machinists too uh, working in the railroad industry. and because the railroad industry was a good communication link uh, that really started to uh, fuel the fire in the machinist union to grow now and the boomers were very important in that uh, uh, 1989 convention. 
When it comes to communications, we have a long history in the Machinist Union, including the first IAM journal. And I think we actually have one of the logos um, from that, where it wasn't called the IAM journal back then. But tell us a little bit about this particular logo. Yes, uh, the, the journal at that time was called the Journal of the United Machinist Mechanical Engineers. Um, and, uh, uh, the journal uh, was printed in time for the first uh, convention. The journal, uh, if you see that logo there, that is very significant. In the same, in 1888, a year prior to this, uh, a fellow wrote a book, uh, C. Osborne Ward, called The Ancient Lowly. And the Ancient Lowly, his research was that of workers in the ancient world. And Athena, in that logo, it was very important to workers in the ancient world, um, starting from Greek and then um, moving on to Roman, um, different goddesses. And workers were uh, uh, were very uh, uh, very important to have goddesses and so on as a part of their uh, heritage. And it goes back to the ancient world, uh, specifically for machinists. He didn't know this then. Uh, they didn't know this because C. Osborne or didn't understand this at that time. But later, archaeological findings find that the god of metal workers was Apetheus, the Greek god Apetheus. Um, and uh, uh, later on in the Roman era, he becomes the Vulcan, the god of fire and molten metal. Uh, so uh, it's very interesting. but. Really, it says something about whoever was involved with the journal was reading a lot of material uh, because uh, then we didn't have the internet to Google things, but we do now. But uh, to be able to uh, understand the Osborne Ward uh, uh, in his writing was pretty significant. And so, machinist uh, in the early journal uh, understood that heritage. And it's, uh, you should also understand, too, that a lot of the early union used to refer to their union hall as the temple hall. And the temple hall goes back to the Knights of Labor, but before that, it went back to the ancient world where workers assembled at temples uh, to conduct their business. So, pretty significant. Looking back... Ranger. Looking back, Charlie, what do you think Thomas Talbot would want us to remember today? Oh, today he'd want us to remember the sacrifices that a lot of workers, a lot of machinists have done throughout the years. If he were looking back from now, he'd see from the time before he started the sacrifices people made, but even after him, sacrifices and to create the machinists the Machinist Union goes on in great periods in its history of the social movement and creating an openness for not just mechanics and machinists, but later on it pioneered and went along with uh, other movements to create unions for all workers. Instead of having a union of how you work, it became a union of where you and that it becomes important for the industrial era. So he would look back and, and say, wow, um, the union really expanded far beyond just that of a railroad shop. Charlie, I know we mentioned earlier that this is D-Day and we have a lot of veterans who are union members, a lot of veterans who are watching. Is there anything that you'd like to say as we look back on D-Day? Sure. Thank you for mentioning today on this day. Um, and I'd give a shout out to uh, Joe Riley. Joe Riley was one of the uh, paratroopers who, who uh, fought on D-Day and several other battles. He was uh, almost captured in Bastogne. Uh, Joe Riley was uh, really quite a, an active machinist member, still active, uh, as I understand, very active retiree. Uh, but the D-Day, Think about this. We were only in World War II for two and a half, about two and a half years when D-Day happened. 
And the historians look at the American involvement in D-Day and World War II, that the Americans really outproduced the enemy. And when we think about outproducing the enemy, we have to give recognition to the workers in North America, building tanks, ships, weapons of all kinds, and really outproducing both Japan and Germany and the Axis allies. Uh, so um, all the sacrifices of the soldiers hitting the beaches and uh, sailors involved and airmen involved in the day was backed up with a lot of sacrifices of workers building the weapon mechanization for them, uh, for the workers to utilize on the day. So we should also honor the workers uh, in North America for uh, their contribution to D-Day. Well, thank you so much, thank Charlie so McAuliffe, McAuliffe, our unofficial oh, historian. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. And he doesn't want me to do this, but I just want to say happy birthday to Charlie. He likes to keep a low profile, but he's done so much to help workers and retirees. So we had to say something after a couple of requests from people who shall remain nameless. But happy birthday, Charlie. Thank you. Well, let us know what you think um, about the history that we just discussed. You can comment on this video to activate your voice. You can give us comments on Facebook, hit the reply button on Twitter. Twitter. We've already had some people talking on Facebook. I'm just going to look down and say hello to a few people. Uh, Erlene Daniels, Ramon Garcia, Elaine Erickson Poland. Um, we also have Jamie Colburn. Um, Thank you so much for commenting and, and for jumping in. And look, happy birthday, brother. We have a comment right there from Erlene Daniels. So you can see our comments right at the bottom of the screen, some of the ones that um, we're going to highlight. So Erlene, thank you so much. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, happy birthday, Charlie, from Elaine Erickson, Poland. So thank you, Elaine, for wishing Charlie a happy birthday. I'm sure he appreciates it. And we're probably making him blush right now because he wanted to remain anonymous, but we couldn't let that happen. Um, and also Joel um, Hetland, Everett welcomes North Carolina, the South Carolina, um, amen, brothers and sisters. Um, so that's a nice message of support um, for all of our new members, and we like to say we're all in solidarity, all in this together. Um, Local 1003, Charles Jones, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm looking over at our monitor, that's why you see me uh, looking down. So Charles, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, keep the comments coming. Let, let us know what you think about the, the historical. Um, Local 51 in Arkansas, Caleb Whitney. Uh, big shout out to you. Thanks for joining us for this show. We appreciate it. And Local A in 751, Luis. We have Luis, and I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, Artiga. Thanks, Luis, for joining us. There's a very slight delay when I look at the monitor instead of uh, uh, the surface that's right in front of me, so that's why I'm leaning over. And howdy from the Southern Territory, from Ramon Garcia. Ramon is one of our regular viewers, so thank you, Ramon, for checking us out. Uh, and keep in touch, Ramon. Let us know what's going on. You know, just call Deirdre Konevsky, our, our communications rep in the Southern Territory, if there's anything that you want her to share with us and let us know what's going on. So we love our communications reps in every territory. We have reps in the Eastern Territory, Canada, Western Territory, Midwest Territory. So we use all of our communications reps in the territories to keep in touch with what's going on uh, on the ground. So keep the comments coming. Thank you so much uh, for commenting. Um, we want you right now to grab your pens and pencils because it's time to take note of important dates that on, are on our calendar. It is contest time, so you still have time to enter our photo and newsletter contest. The deadline is June 15th, so get your entries in as soon as possible. You have a week and a half to find your best photos or submit your newsletter or website. Check goiam.org, that's our website, goiam.org, for in entry information details. And also, we're going to pull up the website for you for ILCA. The Labor Media Awards competition is open for submissions. That is sponsored by the International Labor Communications Association, 
or ILCA, I-L-C-A. You can enter any number of categories, including visual communications, writing, electronic media, organizing, or best multimedia campaign. When you go to the website, all you have to do is click on the categories there, and you see the list here on the website of all the categories. But remember these dates. The physical media, if you're mailing it in, uh, the deadline is July 23rd, and online submissions must be uploaded by July 30th. And for more information on the Labor Media Awards, visit ilkaonline.org. That's I-L-C-A online dot org. Now, if you're a Machinist Union member interested in taking a class this summer at our William W. Wimpasinger Education and Technology Center in Hollywood, Maryland, registrations are due now for classes in August. Those include Leadership One, Train the Trainer, and Spanish Train the Trainer. And you can always get more information at the website, which is wimpasinger.iam. A W dot org at the bottom of your screen right there. If you're interested in taking the community services class in September, that deadline is July 9th. So community services, get your application in by July 9th. We like to say it's the union way to show solidarity, not only in the workplace, but in the community. Our motto is justice on the job, service to the community. Well, the Pennsylvania State Council is wrapping up today in York, so we'd like to give them a shout out. Upcoming council meetings include the Maine Machinist Conference this weekend in Portland. Um, Joe Heckman and I will be there for a special edition of Activate Live. The Iowa State Council of Machinists, June 12th. And the Texas State Council meets June 29th in Fort Worth. As far as the special events go, the Canada Staff Conference is June 20th in Vancouver. The TCU IAM Convention is July 25th in Nevada. The IAM Safety and Health Conference is August 12th in Maryland. And register for that ASAP. And the Pride at Work Convention is August 23rd in Phoenix. And we have good news. The early bird deadline for that convention has just been extended to June 15th. So you still have about a week or so if you want to get that early bird rate. But we are going to leave you now with a look at the strike line in Glendale, West Virginia, where there's a lot of support for the Technocap workers who are part of IAM Local 818 in District 54. This video is produced by our own communications representative, Velana Cochran. See you next Wednesday. For eight long weeks, IAM Local Lodge 818 members have been walking the picket line at Technicap in West Virginia. There once was a time when employees in this country actually cared about their workers. Now it's just how much more can I get out of them? They gave us one proposal, one proposal only, and it was to remove one third of our bargaining unit and to have us attempt to have us to pay for 50 percent of our health care. With the company unwilling to bargain in good faith, IAM members had no choice but to strike and file unfair labor practice charges against the company. Nobody wants to strike, but obviously, uh, you know, we have no choice and we're out here exercising our First Amendment right, letting the community know and the state and the country know that this uh, Italian-based company is a union-busting company at its best and uh, they're not negotiating in good faith. Dozens of allies attended a rally last week to stand in solidarity with these 30 machinists. Their families, along with other local unions and candidates for office, poured in to show their support. We need to be scaling up and treating our workers better. We can't continue on this path because we're mistreating our workers. We're letting people, uh, you know, get pushed out of good jobs. And that means people have to leave West Virginia. These workers are highly skilled at what they do. Some are electricians, others are tool and die makers. But Technicap has brought in replacement workers from other countries to fill their positions. What's going on is a complete disgrace, and we shouldn't allow it. And our politicians shouldn't allow people to come in here on temporary visas and do work that struck. Just shouldn't be legal, and we shouldn't allow it. Choosing to go out on strike is one of the most difficult and yet most courageous choices a union member will make. Harlan has 22 years with the company. He started when he was just 19 years old. He has seen the sacrifices made from his fellow brothers and their families. It's very life-changing when you go from being paid every two weeks to no pay at all. 
you end up using all your savings, pay for bills. A lot of people have had to call their mortgages, to cancel vacations, and just change everything around. You watch what you buy, you watch what you do. Makes it rough for people. John, a tool and die maker, wants nothing more than to go back to work. They won't let us back in, won't give us a good call track. He's often joined by his wife and two daughters on the strike line and knows the choices he makes today are for something much bigger. It's for the future also. It's not just for, you know, me. It's for everybody that has a family, all the little ones. At the time the strike began, Ron was on probation and only had two weeks on the job. But once Ron reached his 60 days, and I handed in a letter stating that I received, um, I attained my probation period and I'd like to join the union and I'd join, be joining my union brothers on the line. <laughs> Ron has worked in other union shops, so he understands the importance of fighting to save these jobs. I don't think we'd have near what we had without them and uh, there's a lot of good, good things come with being, being a union member. After eight long weeks in the cold, rain and heat, the company still refuses to give them a fair contract. But these fighting machinists have no plans on backing down. The IM is going to stand with them each and every step of the way, and we'll be here for as long as it takes for them to get respect and a decent contract for them and their families. So until then, they will hold the line. One day longer than it takes. For the Machinist News Network, I'm Valana Cochran.